Welcome everyone to today's episode of Life in HD, where we invite special guests to come on and chat with us about human design in real life. And if you're new to this channel, I'm your host, Crystal Alferrero. I'm a human design guide and founder of the Human Design Academy. And today we are going to be talking all about life as a self-projected projector and also dive into human design and relationships with our very special guest, Sage, who's a 4-6 self-projected projector and a human design and intimacy guide. Welcome, Sage. How are you? Thank you for being here. Hello. Yes, I'm so excited for being here. Thank you so much for asking me. And I'm doing well today. I'm really excited to get to chat with you, to connect, uh, and to share a little bit about just kind of my experience being a 4-6 self-projected projector and uh, talking a little bit about human design and relationships as well, which has been so uh, incredibly eye-opening for me over the last few years. So mm -hmm. yeah, I'm so excited. Yay. And so Sage, if you could please share a little bit about yourself with our audience for those who don't know you and share a little bit mm -hmm. about what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Sage and I consider myself to be someone who is deeply rooted in community and authenticity and in making deep and meaningful connections, super projector energy. Um, but uh, I think that that is actually a lot of what really drives my life and really drives where I end up in situations and how I've kind of come to be as I am today. And also, you know, the, the work that I do and the jobs that I'm a part of. And so I would say that I am a quintessential guide uh, there. I very much lean into that as a projector. And so I am at the heart, uh, an entrepreneur, someone who is trying to build businesses uh, that really speak to myself and to others and really bridge connection and really help us to uh, deeply understand ourselves so that we can create long lasting, impactful change for ourselves, for our communities and for the world at large. And so I have two beautiful businesses that I'm super proud of. One of them is a consulting uh, organization where I get to guide other you know, nonprofits, for-profit organizations, companies and businesses through change management and really thinking about how we you know, think about change and implementation of change from a more relational context, right? How we orient ourselves to change, how we navigate change to be really sustainable and effective as we're really trying to build a world that we all want to be a part of and can thrive in. And then uh, my other business is more human design centric, more intimacy centric, relationship centric, which is really about helping me and everyone else rebirth our authenticity in a world where I think conditions us to really be inauthentic. And so um, those are kind of my day to day things that I do in kind of the professional world. But uh, outside of that, I consider myself to be an artist, a creative, a visionary. Uh, I really love playing with music. I love acting. I love dancing. Uh, really trying to express myself creatively is something I'm very, very passionate about. Um, and I love games and I love being a little bit of a nerd. Uh, and so I tend to be pretty layered in, in that context. But uh, yeah, just really excited as I've been going out throughout my life, um, just finding myself again and really rebirthing the parts of me that I know have always been there. Um, and it's been so lovely to give them an opportunity to shine. Yes. Uh, and when I hear everything that you're talking about connection, authenticity, this is totally that four, six in alignment, <laughs> right? Like, perfect example. And, you know, from the first time that I met Sage, um, you know, in the human design Academy, it's mm -hmm. like, you just have this energy that shines. There's just something you can tell that you are a self-projected projector <laughs> in the way that you talk in the way that you flow and the way that you describe things so naturally. Um, and actually quick question for you, what you yeah. said, you're a little bit of a nerd. What's the, the nerdiest interest or like, Oh yeah. Thing that you do. <laughs> or, I, I would say, and, or I, and I say in. nerd in a very loving way. Yeah, um, no, of course, of course. In a very loving way. <laughs> Uh, I would say definitely games of all types, but I particularly love dressing up. It's like the mm -hmm. mix of games and acting for me that really like lights me up. Uh, you know, I very recently got into D and D. Uh, I have some partners and friends who are really into it, and so I've been fortunate to be a part of that. And so, yeah, I would say games for sure. Board games in particular, I yeah. love board games. Um, <laughs> I will nerd out about board games forever. Um, yeah, so I think that's where my nerdness definitely shows up, and I love 
learning things. It's really interesting. Yeah. I don't have a one or a three in my profile, but, um, and I don't have tons of that in my chart either, but mm -hmm. I love researching and looking at things and trying new things and things like that. So, um, that's something I really love. And, um, you know, I love reading and I think that's probably part of my projector energy too, as I really like to get real mm -hmm. into stuff, you know, and really dive deep. I mean, that was a little bit about how human design came about for me too. Yeah. And I, I thought you were going to go along the lines of like, um, anime manga and oh, sure. <laughs> I, just, I was yeah, literally I'm... on the treadmill this morning watching Pokemon. <laughs> <laughs> I love that for you. I am new to anime. Um, I'm just, I just about started with avatar, the last airbender. One of my partners watches it. And so oh, I love that. Show. that to me. Yeah. It's so good. Uh, so that's super cute. And a couple of other like Netflix, like animes and things like that. So yeah, we're getting into it. I know we get to relive our second childhood with Netflix. <laughs> We I do. love it. I love it. And so how did you come across human design? How did it come into your life? So in a full circle moment, it was you. Uh, mm -hmm. So I was actually uh, on YouTube and I'm really into astrology and, and other forms of divination and, and spirituality and was kind of just, you know, putzing around on YouTube, looking at things and, and things like that. And then um, I think your video about like, what is human design? Like your very, one of your very first, like just general videos about human design came across the like recommended for you page. And I was like, oh, this looks really interesting. I'm really curious about this. Like, I don't know what it is. Um, and ironically to, to what you said to me earlier, I actually think you have a beautiful way of expressing yourself Aww. and speaking and you have really done an amazing job and continue to do an amazing job, really delineating down something that I feel like can be very overwhelming for folks and can be a lot for, for just like engaging with and really pulling it down to like, here are the basics. Here's what you need to know. You use language that's really accessible and really easy to penetrate into and be like, oh, okay, I understand what she's saying. And I understand what, how these things are connected. Um, it's one of my favorite things about having learned from you and, and been a part of the Human Design Academy. And I just thought, you did a really amazing job, like really bringing this to fruition for me personally. Um, and then I kind of just started deep diving after that. And I mean, I made this TikTok so long ago on an account I don't even have anymore, as I was just like writing in my iPad, all of these things that I was mm -hmm. reading about with projectors and just being like, my whole life makes sense now. Everything makes sense now. <laughs> I totally like my whole existence just makes sense now. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. And thank you, YouTube, for <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> popping me up in, <laughs> in many different um, laptops here. <laughs> but <Yes. laughs> let's take it back to the very beginning. So I'd love yeah. to hear about your experience as, or I guess your childhood experience as a young projector. What was that like for you? And were there any challenges with that? Yeah, this is so interesting because I've spent a lot of time thinking about this. And ironically, you know, uh, my parents aren't super like into a lot of energy stuff. And so they're a little hesitant to like engage super deeply with me about this kind of stuff. So I haven't had an opportunity to pull their charts yet. Uh, but I do have a feeling that my father could be a projector, but he could also be a generator. Mm -hmm. um, and so I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, how how did that show up for me when I was growing up? And, you know, I think something that's really common for a lot of folks is that they get conditioned by their parents to be a particular type based on whatever their parents type is, mm -hmm. that maybe doesn't actually align with their actual type. And there are definitely instances when I look back at growing up that I definitely see, I was definitely conditioned to be more around this generator energy. And I think a lot of us really are right. And just living in this nine to five society that, that prioritizes productivity and capitalism in the way that it does. Um, and so I think when I was younger, there was a lot of just overworking, just overextending myself over, you know, putting myself into situations, um, and things like that. And, you know, I think very early on, um, my voice was very stifled, which, uh, is very interesting as a self-projected projector, especially now that I know that I'm self-projected, uh, because there was a lot of that and I'm sure a lot of people can resonate with this, this kind of cultural narrative, like children should be seen, but not heard. There's like mm -hmm. this narrative of like, you can be around, but like, please don't speak. And for someone like me who needs that ability, right, to speak and express myself and feel the vibration of my voice and my energy, you know, express itself from my actual body. It was really difficult for me to learn my own discernment. And I think mm -hmm. that was one of the biggest things that I feel like looking back, I really recognized is that I didn't have a clear semblance of my discernment and how to make decisions and 
what was actually right for me. And so I was oftentimes looking to everyone else to tell me what I was supposed to be doing and how I was Mm -hmm. supposed to be doing it and what that was supposed to look like. Um, I definitely see this like need for recognition and validation a lot in my childhood, like that I was always kind of seeking that. Um, You know, and I grew up in Japan and was born there. And so was a part of a culture that was already very prone to like perfectionism and specifically with school and education being really intelligent and smart and getting good grades and like being really on top of those things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in my household, all of those things were definitely perpetuated. And so, you know, coming home with my papers and like being like, look, 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 like, look at what I got, look at what I got Mm -hmm. just to receive that, you know, validation. And, And oftentimes I would find that I would prefer to be at school because I was at least receiving that validation very actively at school, right? My teachers were like, oh, you're so smart or, oh, you're so this and um, giving me that, uh, that affirmation. And I, and it's interesting now that I know about the not self theme and the self theme for projectors, you know, the bitterness versus success that I wanted to be at school because I always felt more successful than I did at home. And I found myself feeling more bitter at home and I was more bitter about not being recognized and seen. And I grew up in a military family. So my dad was deployed a lot and was gone. And he was definitely the one that I had the deeper relationship with. And so his recognition and affirmation felt really important to me. And so when he was not even available to provide that for me, right, just because he was just not in physical proximity or available, you know, we didn't have laptops and yeah. Wi-Fi and all that. What's up? Then. And- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when he wasn't available for that recognition and I wasn't getting it, I, you know, there was a lot of bitterness um, and a lot of big feelings about that. Um, so, yeah. So I think those things definitely showed up for me early on. Mm-hmm. And I mean, especially having, do you have a completely open heart? Let me just pull up your chart. Yeah. Yes, oh, I do. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so I can imagine, I mean, let me know if I'm wrong, but growing yeah. up in a military family, I'm sure that there were high expectations um, set for you from the get-go. And so, yeah, I can totally see how you would want to be in an environment where you're at least, you know, receiving that recognition where you, I mean, it, at school. So since they provided you with that recognition, did you still feel like you had to prove yourself in that way because of the environment that was there itself or? Yeah, I didn't feel like I had to prove myself, but I think something I'm still working through even now is this fear of being wrong or making a mistake or not getting something right. I think I was receiving so much accolade and recognition and attention at Mm -hmm. school for, for doing so well that anytime I would make a mistake, anytime I would raise my hand and get the answer wrong, I just would beat myself up and beat Mm -hmm. myself up and beat myself up. And it's really interesting that you mentioned my open heart because the only two centers I have defined are my throat and my G center. And so I always had a strong sense of self and direction. And I was like, I know what I'm doing. I know where I'm going. I know Mm -hmm. what I'm I know who I am, yeah. but then all of my other defined centers were like, do you really, do you really yeah. know? Do you really know? Do you really know? Like, oh no. <laughs> oh boy. And so that open heart was a big part of that, right? That self-esteem, that, that ability to really like tap into myself and say, no, I trust myself and, and really pull that discernment and that ability to know myself, which I really didn't develop until later on. But, um, that was a lot of what was happening is like, I felt like I knew who I was. I was always Mm -hmm. so strong. I was always so confident in who I was, but then there was always this like insecurity that also like loomed around me. And I felt like, you know, just with that open heart for sure that I was just never enough, never doing enough, that I was never going hard enough. Um, you know, that any mistake was a, was a sign that, you know, I wasn't meant to be there that, you know, I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be. Um, so yeah, I think that really showed up for me a lot in school. Mm -hmm. And did you see any, um, I'm going to say like cultural shifts and like differences Mm -hmm. in how you felt when you were in Japan versus being in Mm -hmm. the States when you did move? Yeah, I would say that being in Japan and living there felt more free. I felt like I had more autonomy. I felt like I had more ability to just be in the world and navigate it. You know, it's very common in Japanese culture for young children to just be mm-hmm. walking around, you know, at a very young age. By I've themselves. seen that show. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and my my birth mother really leaned into that. You know, we were very much on our own from a very young age, um, walking around and just providing for ourselves and, and things like that. And again, I think that's really my G-Center, like really pumping up that, that 
idea of self-direction of really knowing who I am, like really developing myself. And Mm -hmm. I didn't feel a lot of pressure, you know, and maybe it's because I was so young still, you know, I definitely don't want to say that this is true for people who are older in that community. But when I was younger, the, the pressures of, of being, uh, you know, female presenting person and being socialized that way didn't feel as heavy. Um, Mm -hmm. And I felt like there was a lot more freedom to explore and expand. You know, I was given more freedom to speak in those spaces. And so that really, I think, pulled out a lot of my, like, uh, my own self projector authority and gave me a lot of space to do that. And then, yeah, I think when I moved to America, I think something that really happened to me as a projector, particularly is that instead of penetrating, I tried to assimilate. So Mm -hmm. instead of like just being present and and aware of what was going on and penetrating the things around me, I tried to become one with the things around me. And I, and I misunderstood and misinterpreted my penetrative aura as like, I am you and you are me and I have to be like you and I have to do what you're doing and I have to look and feel and, and act the way that you do. And I think that's been like the most interesting, uh, evolution for me in the human design space is just seeing how I went from navigating my very penetrative aura from like becoming one with a person to still penetrating somebody else's aura and still seeing myself as an individual in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know that's, that's a big one. Right. And how have you been able to go through that and navigate that in your deconditioning journey as a self-projected projector, you know, coming into this, what we call melting pot in the States and still being able to separate yourself from that. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, being able to separate myself really just comes a lot back to kind of releasing this idea of people pleasing, you know, and I I talked a little bit earlier about my four line, my four line, I feel like has been the biggest lesson on codependency I've ever received. Um, Because I think that for me, especially the, the expression of the four line that is not most aligned for me is codependency, right? Where you become so entrenched in your relationships and your network and your connections that you feel so dependent on them and that you, you know, feel this sense of like, oh, I have to to be everything for you. I have to do everything like you because I am so dependent on these relationships and this network. And what I've really come to grow and evolve into is this idea of interdependence and really realizing that Yes, having a strong base, having a strong community, having a strong network is great and amazing. And I do need that, but it is the thing that helps me thrive. It is not the thing that keeps me, you know, small or compacted or, you know, connected in this way that, that keeps me from expanding myself and really understanding that depending on other people and relying on other people is okay if you do it in a way where you also still have your own sovereigns and your own independence in that conversation, right? And in that exchange. And so really coming to this place of interdependence has been really powerful for me over the last, I would say, you know, maybe five or six years um, that I've really been diving into it. Because I definitely think when I, when I first moved here, that codependency really came up for me in that four line and really trying to become one with my communities in a way that did not allow me to keep my independence. And so I would say the thing that has really helped me with that is this ability to discern what it is that I actually want versus what everyone else wants, right? Mm -hmm. And being able to most specifically communicate that. And, you know, for me, communication is very much in my voice and very much in my verbal communication. But, you know, I think for other people, it could look other ways, right? I think Mm -hmm. it could look, if you're not a verbal speaker, maybe it's the way you communicate through text or through written form or using other media to communicate to other people in certain ways. But I think really understanding for yourself what is it that you actually want? What is it that you're actually looking for and trying to do with your life? And how do you build that around you? And how do you invite people into to be in those conversations and in those situations with you versus just trying to be a part of whatever's going on and trying to make yeah. yourself fit right into those things? Yeah. And so, I I mean, I can definitely see you've had a lot of experiences with the relationships, you know, <laughs> in, in so many shapes and forms. and so you know, let's kind of trail into that and and dive into that a bit more. So how does, you know, tying this back to human design as well, how does human design help people improve their relationships? You talked a lot about communication and all these things. So what are some things that you'd, that you want other people to know about human design in terms of relationships? Yeah. 
I think one of the most powerful things about human design in relationships is this ability to say, I am so clear on who I am and what my energetic body is that I can now engage with your energetic body in a way that doesn't deplete me and doesn't deplete you and actually harnesses particular energies that we cannot have unless we are energetically bonded or connected together in a space. And I think that there is something so powerful about being able to come to the table as your own sovereign individual being and face another sovereign individual being, and then think about how do we come together as a unit and and in connection and create this whole other sovereign Mm -hmm. being right together. Um, And I would say that that's been probably the most powerful thing for me in relationships. And I think the other thing that's been really powerful for me is that it's given me such clear language and such clear structure for how to approach people when I'm going into relationships. So I'm polyamorous. So I have a few different partners. Um, I'm a projector. My live-in partner, the person that I cohabitate with is a manifesting generator. And then I have another, I have another generator partner. And then I, my girlfriend is a projector. Mm-hmm. So, uh, my cohabitating partner, who's a manifesting generator, I love him so much. I love manifesting generators. <laughs> They're one of my favorite types. They're like little chaotic energizer bunnies and it's like the best. Yeah. Um, it's so fun. I surround myself with lots of MGs. Oh, we need um, it. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I'm like, give me, give me, give me. <laughs> so yeah. So I live with a, a manifesting generator and one of the best things that, you know, we've ever done in our collectively together, but also individually is when we moved in together, we knew after engaging about human design and our energetic bodies and types that we needed separate bedrooms. So we actually cohabitate with separate bedrooms as a way to give me my space to be able to sleep alone when I need to, to be able to recharge my energy, to be able to rest and recuperate and rejuvenate in a space that feels really comfortable for me and really aligned to the energy that I'm trying to put out in the world and that I'm trying to receive. And so I get to create my room, you know, however I want. He gets to create his room however we want. And we get to have this very clear understanding of like, okay, sometimes we take time apart. Okay, sometimes we, you know, have our separate spaces and things like that because he's also a four six. So our oh, four sixes are naturally just trying to always codepend on each other. We're yeah. always like kind of <laughs> we're always kind of checking in because we're constantly trying to be like super codependent on one another. Yeah. And we have to constantly be like, oh, wait, hey, is this really what we want to be doing? Like, do we really, you know, we'll go. And something that can really happen for us is we'll go like 10 days together. Well, we're just spending tons and tons and tons of time together. My energy is penetrating his, he's giving me life force (laughs) energy. Our four sixes are like having a great time. Yeah. It's just a lot. Uh, And then it's almost like coming up out of the water for a second and being like, Ooh, like maybe we need like a minute to separate. Cause you know, one thing I will say about being a projector and a four, six in particular is that you need an escape strategy. And I don't Mm -hmm. mean that as intense as it sounds, but you Mm -hmm. do because you penetrate. And so you have to, how are you going to detach? And I don't think we talk a lot about that as projectors about the importance of yes, what it looks like to make the initial invitation or be invited and say yes to that. But how do you then also know when enough is enough and actually move away from that Mm -hmm. penetration and say, okay, I need to be back in my own energy. I need to be back in my own space for a minute because I've been so penetrated into other people for, you know, a period of time. And that's been a big thing for us, you know, and I think something else that comes up for us a lot is that he very much embraces my projector aura type and really leans into asking me questions and inviting me into things and inviting me into conversations with him about what he's doing and, you know, helping, letting me help him guide on, you know, his job and his career and things like that. But I mean, even just recently, but then we had to check in and I had to be like, okay, I, I need to make sure I'm not overextending myself here, right? That just because Mm -hmm. you're my partner, that I'm not overextending all of my guidance and all of my sharing and wisdom in a way that doesn't feel good for me and is tapping me out, right? Right. And so really checking in about that and him being able to hear that is such a, is such a beautiful thing. And it's so relieving because I think sometimes we can feel really scared in relationships to communicate Mm -hmm. with people with what we want because we're afraid that they're going to receive that poorly or as a reflection of them. Right. And being able to express to him like, Hey, I need some alone time or, Hey, I need some time and space away because of my particular energetic body and the way that it operates. It's almost like he 
like doesn't even go through the phase of defensiveness because he's already at the place of understanding, right? He's already mm-hmm. like, oh, I know you're going to ask for this. I don't need yeah. to feel defensive or feel personally attacked by this because I know you're going to ask because this is how your energetic body works. And then he sees the benefits of that, right? Because when I yeah. step away and rejuvenate myself, I come back so much stronger and he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's been a really big part of how you know human design has helped our relationship in particular. Yeah, I like definitely everything that you're saying. It's so, you know, human design, it's what helps you cultivate that understanding of your partner. So we're not judging them. We understand that nothing is ever personal in relationships, right? right? And it's exactly what you said. How do we come together so we can still remain our individual selves and create this new entity, right? This Mm -hmm. new thing. Um, And we're not just kind of what you're saying, like codependent and meshed and Mm -hmm. holding expectations on your partner that are not what your partner is or who your partner is. Right. Mm -hmm. And I was exactly, I was just going to ask you, I'm like, or do you sleep in the same beds or, uh, you know, (laughs) and so it's great that, you know, you have established that trust, that safety, that security to communicate that need in your relationship and be okay with, uh, I'm going to say like experimenting with that. And I know like for some people for economic reasons for, you know, absolutely there's, it might not be, um, feasible, but yes, you know, whenever I get the chance, it's, and I have a projector husband, but when we come together, Uh we still have that, that sacral energy going. And so actually right now, my daughter's at, um, her grandparents place for the week. So he's been like (laughs) in her room and I'm in our room and it's just nice to like, you know, have that separate space together and your sleep quality changes. Like it totally does. It does. When you're by yourself. Totally does. I, I think maybe you were the one that said it in the human design Academy during one of the, the classes about this. And I hadn't even, I'd never thought about it. I had never thought about it. And I, for the longest time. So when I started moving out on my own, I had always lived with someone else. I've always lived with someone else. I'd always, someone that was always in my space. I cohabitated with a lot of my partners. So I was sleeping in the same bed with a lot of my partners, no separation. And then we went through COVID and COVID was the first time I was actually truly like alone and like by myself, living by myself in my own space. And the quality of sleep that I got in those three years, I was like, oh, no, 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 no. I will not give this up. Like, I was like, this is so great. And so then when I started thinking about cohabitating with my now partner, I had to express this to him. I, you know, I was Mm -hmm. like, Hey, you know, I've noticed that I feel better when I sleep by myself and I'm going to need space to do that. And we cannot cohabitate together unless that's something that you're okay with, or, you know, something that you're willing to work with me on. And, you know, if you're not, that's okay. We just won't be able to cohabitate. We can still be together. We just, we just maybe not take that step in our relationship. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it was, really nice to be able to communicate that to him and him to be able to receive that as, oh, this is about you and your energy. This isn't about me or not wanting to sleep next to me or things like that. And, and you're right. It totally changes the quality of your sleep. I feel more energized and renewed, rejuvenated, more aligned to me and myself. I I just feel better in the world. And don't get me wrong. I, we still definitely share a bed, you know, um, um, maybe the majority of the time, but mm-hmm. I would say a good 40% of the time we're not sharing a bed together. And I try really hard to cultivate that. And something that I really love about him is that even though he doesn't need that, he also puts effort into cultivating that for us because he knows I need that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he really is also like aware of when we are not sleeping apart on us and he's like, Hey, you need I think we need to, you know, yeah. sleep apart tonight. And so that's, just, it's just so nice to have someone mm-hmm. who's so aware and so willing to, to, ex- to extend that to you and, and, and invite you into that. Yeah. And do you use human design language with him or is he yes. into this stuff? Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. I've read his chart. I've looked at his charts. We've looked at our charts together. We've talked about, you know, our defined and undefined centers together and how they operate some of our, uh, gates and things like that. The channels that we activate when we're together, um, we really look at our aura type right now. We, we really do orient around a lot of that. And then a lot around our energy centers. That's a big mm-hmm. one. And then our first six profile, cause they match. Uh, we talk about that quite a bit as well. Yeah. And I mean, there's a lot of resonance there. And so I'm sure like, you know, there's that level of ease and level of being at home mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. a lot of ways as well. And yeah. does he have uh, a defined emotional center? 
No, we both oh, have okay. undefined emotionals. Okay. And so this is so fascinating because this is another relationship thing. I was with a partner who has, who had a defined emotional center and I felt like that was the most turbulent emotional relationship I had ever <laughs> been in. <laughs> it was like so rough for me because I was just yeah. like spiraling and like always just like kind of out here with my emotions. And he was just so like, and I was just like, Oh, I can't. And so then mm. my part, my, uh, my partner, who's an MG with the open center, we will just, we can go for hours just in an emotional conversation. And it's not like we're spiraling or it's like emotionally yeah. volatile. It's just, yeah, he sees what I'm saying. I see what he's saying. Like mm-hmm. we can just explore the vastness of the ocean of emotions. And it's like, we, we get it. Like we, we just jive together. It, this is a little yeah. bit of a bias I have. I'm yeah. totally honest. I'm like, man, I don't know that I will ever date anybody. It is what it is, right? Like there's, I mean, it totally is what it is. And, um, you know, I've experienced, and actually, does he have a defined heart center? Or he no? does not. Okay. No. Oh, wow. So there's must, there must yeah. be like a lot of ease. I feel like there's a lot yeah. of peace, Yeah. you know, feeling like yes. home and it makes sense that you, that you live together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's the partner that you live with. <laughs> yeah. Right. He's very comforting. He's very soothing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And how about your other partners? Do they have like, okay, so let's compare this to your girlfriend who's a project projector, yeah. right? Yes. So yes. what's She's a the difference in those two relationships yeah. and how do you change your communication? Yeah. Uh, so she's a, she's a splenic okay. projector and she's, uh, sorry. Uh, my other partner's, uh, she's a one, three. So she's a one, oh, three. Too. <laughs> yeah. I love that. One, three, um, and oh, you're also a one, three splenic. Yeah. Oh, how funny. Oh yeah. my God. This is crazy. <laughs> Yeah. And so she also has an undefined emotional center also. Mm -hmm. And so her and I also will go through the depths of the emotions and things together. Um, Dating projectors is very interesting because the person with the defined emotional center was also a projector. Mm -hmm. Um, And I ironically feel like I struggle the most with dating projectors. Yeah. (laughs) I think that that's the place that I struggle. Generators feel easy. MGs feel super easy. Um, I've never dated a manifester or a reflector, but the, um, but yeah, with projectors, I would say something that I feel like I've really learned with her. And I think is a really powerful gift for all projectors is that we, I think have this beautiful ability to curate invitations in a way that nobody else does. I think because we're so driven by that strategy, mm-hmm. we are so adept or inept at like really understanding how do I invite a person into something? How do I recognize them? How do I bring awareness to their gifts and skills and talents and then invite them into something? And I think that's something that really shines in my projector relationship with my girlfriend. Her and I have this really beautiful ability to invite each other into things, but we Mm. also struggle with that, right? Because we're both kind of waiting for the invitation. So it's kind of like, who's going to make the invitation first? Like, what's that going to look like? Um, and I think she's very much still very much engaging with her authority, with her splenic authority. Mm -hmm. She is very, very conditioned not to trust herself and not to listen to her, her initial instincts. And that is her whole way of like, you know, actually using her discernment. And so she really struggles with tapping into that and leaning into that and really going with that. Um, and that's something that she's been really working on. And so in our relationship, I think that that sometimes, you know, creates a barrier for us sometimes because I'm trying to use my authority to talk things out with her and like Mm -hmm. communicate with her. And then sometimes she's not tapped into her spleen. So she's not really communicating with me what her initial response is or what her initial thoughts are. Um, and she has an undefined heart as well. And so I Mm -hmm. think she struggles with like, you know, am I doing enough? I I should be better at this. I should, you know, all of these types of things and and those insecurities really pop up for her. And so I would say our relationship is very deep though. I do feel very seen by her. I feel Mm -hmm. very recognized by her. You know, she is someone who's not a traditional romantic. I tend to be more of a traditional romantic. And Mm -hmm. so it's been an interesting process for us to like really delineate what are invitations in a traditional sense of romance and like non-traditional sense of romance and how do we build that bridge when we come together Mm -hmm. um but she's got a lot of open centers as well so I think we Mm -hmm. definitely have a fluidness together and ease together where we flow together um and then I think she's just very much learning how to engage um her authority in particular she also has um she either has a defined head or defined ajna or oh no 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 actually i think she has them both defined now that i'm thinking okay. about it so she has a defined yeah. head and, and ajna <laughs> and so 
so then with her, it's a lot of, I, both of those are open for me. So I'm like, mm-hmm. la di da di da di Yeah, like, you know, all of that every, amplify. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then she's like, very like, no, da, 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 like, oh, you know, very like I know structured. we're not the <laughs> easiest <laughs> to deal with. I feel like you're talking about me. She's very like, and so, which is cute. And I love that. And it's great. And so it's interesting in our dynamic where I'll be like, what do you think about this? Or what do you think about that? And then mm-hmm. she'll like, it's just watching her expand and evolve over time. And, and she's got that one three. So she's, mm-hmm. she'll, I'll say something and then like, I'll come back a week later. She's like, so I did my research and I looked at this and, did this <laughs> I this. and I'm like, I guess I'm like, this is great. And she really lends it. She's starting to really lean into that three line too, with that trial mm-hmm. and error and like really allowing herself to like, really just like step into those things, you know, she's Explore been, and- yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And opening herself up to, to, to new things. You know, I think she really struggles with change. I think that's a big part um, of, of what she navigates. And so in our relationship, you know, I try a lot to, to help her with the, that, again, that sustainability of change and that ever evolvingness of life, right. That, that things are always changing and we're always evolving and growing and, and how to do that as a projector too, because I think sometimes we can get really stuck as projectors in a specific way of being, because we think that's what we're supposed to be doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's tough. Like sometimes you feel ashamed. And I mean, at least me growing up, like yeah. feeling ashamed because it's yeah. like, I don't, I don't resonate with everything that you're trying to tell me to do. Like, I don't feel yeah. good about this. It feels like yeah. death. <laughs> I don't know how yeah. else to describe yeah. it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm sure there's a lot of like coming into your own and, you know, there's also that resonance with just being the same type as well. Like I'm sure mm-hmm. you've found, you know, and especially you being a projector and seeing the, seeing the gifts of each of your partners and what each person brings to the table and recognizing that. Um, and so there's a lot of understanding and compassion that can be cultivated with yes. human design. Um, and I guess I don't want to leave out <laughs> your generator partner either. That's okay. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but, I love my generator partner. <laughs> yeah. And tell me, it, does he have a defined emotional center, heart center, motors? Um, he open, defined, uh, and emotional. He's got his sacral. He got, he's got his spleen, um, and root. He's got okay. an undefined G and undefined throat and head and Ajna as well. And then he's okay. a three, five. Oh, well, he's okay. Three, five. Yeah. Yeah. So he's got that seductive line. He's got that yeah. five line. That's like, Ooh, um. <laughs> the mystery. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The mystery, the mystery with that yeah. one. Yes. Yeah. He's very mysterious in a very, very sweet way. Mm-hmm. Um, so he's a generator. And I think one of the best parts about being with him is letting him lean into that generator joy. Like mm-hmm. when he is like talking about something that he loves, that he's excited about, that he's passionate about. I mean, I could just sit there for hours and listen to him. Um, and he's got that undefined throat too. Right. So yeah. there's a lot of times when we're together where I can tell he's really pulling on me and my defined throat yeah. and like really <laughs> engaging that. And he'll just talk and talk and talk. And I'm just like, yes, yes, yes. yes tell me everything. You're a great listener, um, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I love it. I love it so much. And I think it's because I have a defined throat, right? I'm mm-hmm. so comfortable speaking that mm-hmm. I love listening to other people speak. I'm like, tell me everything. What do you have to say? Like, what mm-hmm. is it? Um, and so he really dives into that. I love that. And he's got that defined sacral. And so I think he identifies that defined sacral with less of a life force energy and more of like a doing for other people energy, which mm-hmm. I think is a common confusion for generators. And so yeah. we've been really working a lot in our relationship, you know, how to discern that life force energy from, you know, am I just doing this to do this energy? Right. And how mm-hmm. am I nurturing and curating my own life force energy? And so we do a lot of work in our relationship where I'm like, tell me no. I'm going to ask you for something, work on telling me no, work on, you know, this like kind of gut reaction of a yes or a no, like, do you actually want to do this? And, and he really leans into my projector energy a lot and, you know, asks me for my advice and is like, you know, what do you think about this? And, you know, that gives me an opportunity to be like, okay, well, let's do a gut check. Like, yes or no. How do you feel about this particular question? Like, yes or no, this question. Um, and so we do a lot of that work together. Uh, and then I think with his open G center and my Define G Center, we do a lot of work together about like what is in alignment for you. You know, he's been in a lot of like 
upbringings around religion and particular mm -hmm. doc indoctrination and things like that. So we we work a lot on that together and really thinking about that. And, um, you know, that three line with, with the trial and error, he's very much just kind of doing and going and like trying new things. And I really love being a part of like getting to witness that because I think it's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I man, generators and MGs, oh, man. <laughs> I love it. They're so great. <laughs> yeah. I see you have a type. It's all about that yeah. six or three line, right? <laughs> Yeah, the adventure, very, the <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and I mean, I really lean heavily into my sixth line around like we got to be growing. Like I can't do stagnant. Like stagnant is not a vibe for me. Like I need to mm -hmm. feel like we're moving, that we're growing, and like that doesn't mean like you have to be with me forever. That we have yeah. to be growing in the same direction, but. I want to see that you're growing. I want to see that you're investing in yourself, that you are pulling yourself, you know, into alignment with the best version of who you're supposed to be. Like, I want that for you. Right. And I think human design is such a tool for that. I, I'm such a big proponent in relationships to, you know, I say this a lot to all of my partners. I want what's best for you, whether that includes me or not. You know, if that doesn't include me, that's fine. I respect that. And I'll be sad. And of course that would be hard and all of those things, but you should always be in service of you. And so, and how I can be of service in this relationship is to continuously remind you who you are and, and, and what is enough service to you. And so human design really allows me to do that. You know, with my MG partner, I'm like, hey, how many things are you doing right now? Okay, you're doing eight different things. Maybe let's scale that back to like yeah. six different things and think about how we're gonna engage in all of those things meaningfully and, and all of that kind of stuff. You know, with my generator, are you following your joy? Are you working on this project because you wanna be working on this project or you feel like you have to be working on this project? You know, with my projector girlfriend, I'm constantly like, are you resting enough? Are you following, you know, mm -hmm. the things that, that really light you up, that bring you the sense of comfort, you know, are you listening to your instincts? And I think that when we're committed to other people's goodness in that way, in the, in, in, in their best version, the highest version of themselves, mm -hmm. we build some of the most conscious relationships because we're, we're constantly asking yes. ourselves, like, what are we doing here? Like, what am I doing here? What are yeah. we doing here? What are we building? What are we creating together just in myself, but also in community and with each other? And I think that dedication and that level of commitment to somebody else's highest good is, is one of the ways that human design is such a powerful tool for relationships. Mm -hmm. And you get to share that success, share that yes. satisfaction and and take all of that in. And, yeah. you know, you've had experience with like, you know, I'm going to say, how has actually human design, um, I forget what I was going to go with that. I okay. just had the thought come in and it went, <laughs> bye. <laughs> so let's take a step back here. Um, yeah. But, you know, being um, in polyamorous relationships yeah. how has I guess human design changed the way you navigate them before and then how mm. was navigating polyamory sorry I think I'm gonna mm -hmm. rephrase that I think you know what I'm trying to say but yeah yeah how yeah, has, yeah how has human design helped you navigate polyamorous or relationships polyamory before mm -hmm. and after basically. Yeah. This is such I'm like tripping question. on my words today. What's going no, on? You're great. You're doing great. It's that undefined throat girl. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Define head and edge, not nothing. Ew. Pulling on just pull, just pull. like <laughs> pulling on threads here. I'll just yeah. give it away. Here you go. Um, yeah. I think it's impacted it a lot to be totally honest. I think I have always been really thoughtful about, you know, who am I being in relationship with and what does that look like? But I think now it's given me more individuality for each of my partners, right? You know, not that I wasn't treating people like individuals before, but it's given me a much more detailed individuality of, of people. And even thinking about how we work as a group too, right? When the four of us are hanging out together or spending time together or doing something together, I'm the only one that's dating all three of them, but the four of us make a group, right? We make a unit mm -hmm. when we're together and we all tap into each other's energies when we're together as well, right? Um, and so just really being able to talk about those things and say, okay, you know, oh, the three of us have defined throats and we've got un one undefined throat in here. And so, you know, we are all really cognizant of how much airtime are we all taking up? Have we allowed the person with the undefined throat to share? Have we invited them in? Have we given them space? You know, those types of things. With two projectors in the group, we talk a lot about like, are we getting enough rest? Is there enough like 
even flow in the in whatever activity that we're doing um and you know each of us getting space and time to be alone even in a group setting and things like that and so just being able to identify how the group works together is something that's really new for me mm -hmm. in polyamory with human design and i think before that you know and I think just before human design in general, I was always really attuned to everybody's energies and what was going on and what was happening, but I never had language for it. I never mm -hmm. knew like how to express it. I was always like picking yeah. up on little things here and there and like being like, oh, this is interesting. I'm experiencing this thing or I'm witnessing this thing, but I never knew how to express it. And I always felt uncomfortable expressing it because I was like, they're going to take this poorly. I, I don't know what I'm saying. Like, this is just going to be weird. Like, I feel like people are not going to understand what I'm, what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really helped me with that. Just really being able to, to codify language and name like, oh, yes. this is what I'm seeking. This is what I, you know, who I am in my energetic body and what I have to offer into, you know, a collective space around a relationship. It's also been really beautiful for me to think about my capacities in polyamory as well, right? Being able to communicate to my partners, like, you are going to feel a very deep sense of connection with me because I don't know how to do it any other way. And so that means you're also going to witness me having deep connections with the other people I'm in relationships with. And I don't want you to take that as like a diminishing of like my connection with you or like how deep we go. Like this is just how I operate. And mm -hmm. being aware of that is super important because my, my other two partners, especially the generator and Manny Jenny are not like that. My Manny Jenny partner, uh-uh. He's just like running around like, <laughs> like a free, like a little flower, like just having the best time. And yeah. it's just like, you know, making these like one-off connections, like, which is really beautiful, but he's just like, bye. Like, <laughs> and yeah. I'm just like, <laughs> you know, like, I was like, I'm so connected to everyone. Um, yeah. So, but like, but even just being able to accept that about him and like realize he doesn't need to do polyamory in the same way that I do polyamory, right? Maybe mm -hmm. his interactions are a little bit more casual or more open-ended versus mine that feel really deep and really structured and connected and penetrated. Um, and so it's been really beautiful to allow me to see how he also does polyamory differently and how my other partners do polyamory differently based on their design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. And, you know, it just, it, what you're saying, it gives you that language. And sometimes it's like without that, that tool, not that it becomes more difficult, but I'm sure it's like, you have to be a lot more creative with how you yes. navigate things and be a lot more on your toes, but to have the system that gives you like yeah. specifics <laughs> and different yeah. areas, you get to see different challenges and where people might, I'm going to say like experience conditioning, where they might be more sensitive in, in certain yep. areas and how you can both navigate that. Um, and it's, I, I mean, they're so lucky that they have you in the, <laughs> they have in the, the human mix. design guide in the, in the group. <laughs> like pulling in the reins. Yeah. You'll be like, Hey, 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 let's right. look at your charts. Yeah. I've read yeah. all their charts. We, we've, we've talked about it all together. Like, Oh, that's yeah, awesome. I think <laughs> it's so great. It really is. It's just, you know, and I, and I say this a lot in the guiding that I do too. It's, it's not a one and done. And, and you really express this as well in the human design Academy. None of this is a one and done. Like this is all expansive. It's meant to really invite you into exploration. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like it's done that. And it's really given me and my partners all an opportunity to take more of an expansive look on our energetic bodies and how we operate, because it is really real. Like I, yeah. I really believe that like every one of us is very different in how we energetically engage and it's important for us to know what that is and what that looks like and it's not a be all end all for sure but it is definitely a tool and a powerful one at that oh my goodness yeah no for sure and are there any like common i'm going to say like common challenges among mm. the three relationships that you mm. have or mm. challenge if you know we don't have to make it <laughs> yeah because yeah. i know they're this so different but yeah. is there something common between these and how do yeah. you navigate that? I think with my projector partner, it's a little bit of what I talked about before with the invitations. We both really struggle with inviting each other in and mm -hmm. we oftentimes mirror each other a lot. So yeah. we went to this like queer prom thing together, which oh, was that's super so cool. fun. <laughs> yeah. And so before we went, we were both like, oh, I have a surprise for you. And I was like, I have a surprise for you. So then we show up to the, like, I pick her up for the date and she has made me a little boutonniere for my little Aww. outfit. And I made her like a little corsage for her. And you didn't know? Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah, that, that's what we were doing. But like, that just speaks to 
the beautifulness of how we can tap into one another, right? And how we can also, as projectors, really see each other. Because she knew I was going to dress up and like be mm-hmm. really fancy. And I knew she was going to dress up and be really fancy. And because I know that about her and I've seen that her, about her and, and same with me. Um, so we do a lot of that where we like really mirror each other. But then we also really struggle with like not feeling recognized or seen by the other person, right? Because we do feel so deeply seen all the time. So then Mm -hmm. when something happens where we're not seeing each other clearly or or our effort for each other is kind of missing each other, that's really stressful for us and and, Mm -hmm. and definitely strains us a little bit in those spaces because we become so accustomed, I think, to seeing each other so deeply. And and I think we both definitely feel it when we're, when we're missing out on that. Mm -hmm. For my generator partner, I think our define and undefined throw is the thing that I struggle with the most. Yeah. Uh, mainly because I'm always trying to find the right times to like interject with him. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes he's just like talking and talking and talking and talking and talking <laughs> again, like that undefined throw. It's so sweet. I love it so yeah. much. Um, but then I'm like, where do I pop in? Like, where do I say something? And so then sometimes he'll just like get into conversations with you know, another person there. And then I'm kind of like, okay, when do I jump in? Or when do I like show up for this conversation? Um, So that sometimes comes up. And then I think, you know, like I was talking about before, sometimes he confuses his sacral energy with like giving energy and um, he very much wants to like be of service and of Mm -hmm. use. And so I tend to not um, always invite him into like, you know, can you drive me to the airport or can you do this thing for me or or what have you? And for that, that really resonates for him and and really is something he likes to use his sacral energy for is is giving in partnerships in that way. And so I think Mm -hmm. that's been something I'm really trying to work on. uh, And especially as a projector in our relationship to recognize that more in him and like invite him more into doing those things. But I think that that can show up for us sometimes um, as a struggle. And then my sweet, sweet Manny Jenny, uh, the most difficult thing is his chaotic energy. I am just like, <laughs> what is happening sometimes? Um, he is a little bit scatterbrained and all over the place. And I say that with all of the love in the world. Um, mm. And so we really struggle sometimes because I'm very structured and I'm like, what's happening? Mm-hmm. What are you doing? And then I, I have to check myself because sometimes I'll get a little overbearing and a little mo- like too mothering and like, yeah. you know what I mean? And be like, what are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you-? Mm-hmm. And he's like, what's happening? And I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's, it's me. It's me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I think that's like a big, uh, can be a, a stress point for us is, is me just really, really trying to step back and allowing him to like really dive into that MG energy, even though it like makes me very uncomfortable. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I think what I see from all this is that it's simply communication and mm-hmm. self-awareness that mm-hmm. can help defuse yes. these situations. You know, mm-hmm. we talk a lot about being compatible or not being compatible, but right. no matter how you look at it, we have the tools to transcend any of these perceived problems that we have. It just takes absolutely you know, love, understanding, acceptance of your partner as them, right? And mm-hmm. not trying to change them. Yes. Yes. Right? I think that's a huge yes. thing. <laughs> yes. And that's like a big thing about human design too. That's really taught me like you're your energetic, energetic body was made this way. Like you're, you're perfect. Like, I don't need to change you. I don't need to like try to make you better. Right. What I want to do is be a steward of your energy. I want to be a good steward of your energy and yeah. yeah, And like what you're doing with it. Right. I want to, I want to be someone that helps you steward that energy again for the alignment of you and your highest good and the best version of yourself. And I trust that, right. Like if we're in partnership together and we're moving in that same direction, that that it'll work out exactly as it's meant to, right? Whether that means we stay together or not. Um, And so, yeah, I think that's what human design really teaches me about relationships is how to be a good steward of other people's energies. Absolutely. And for those that are looking for, you know, insights or help in their relationships, do you do anything or do you have any resources to, you know, cultivate more conscious relationships? Yeah, I do actually. Thanks for asking. So for those of you who are interested, I share a lot of content about human design and relationships, the mixture of those two things on all of my platforms. So you can follow me um, at Butterfly Priestess on Instagram or TikTok. That's the name of my heart-centered business. 
And uh, those two platforms will have tons of like free content and videos. And then I also have a website available. If you want to go to butterflypriestess.com, um, you can sign up for a reading with me. I have some uh, counseling or coaching sessions as well available for intimacy. If you want to talk about human design and relationships and things like that. I'm also working on some blogs and some uh, digital content right now as well. I know one of the big things that I'm hearing in the space right now is that human design can be a little bit inaccessible for the price range which is super um, understandable and very valid. Uh, and so while I do have some higher end offerings on my website, uh, the digital content will be priced at a little bit of a lower end um, to really accommodate and help for a little bit more accessibility for folks that are interested. Um, so I'm going to start out with some content on just the different aura types, but I will be making some content on um, the different aura types and engaging in relationships as well. Awesome. Yay. I'll definitely, um, I'm going to share all of Sage's yeah. information in the description below for you. So you can reach out, say hi and get to experience her lovely energy. Oh, I'm, I can't believe how fast time is going. It's already been, I like know. An hour. <laughs> oh my gosh. So I, know. <laughs> I guess to kind of wrap up our chat for today, what's your favorite quote or mantra that you'd like to share with us? Yeah. I've had this favorite quote for as long as I can remember, <clears throat> and it's by the poet, Maya Angelou. Uh, and it is, people will forget um, what you did, but they will not forget how you made them feel. And I just think that that is such a powerful quote because uh, I think that feelings and emotions and energy exchange is such a huge part of how we navigate the world. And the more that we can become aware of, of the imprint that we're leaving behind and the energy that we are exuding into spaces is such a powerful way to think about just like leaving our legacy in the world. Beautiful. Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, feelings, it's what creates that memory in your, in your body. Right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so powerful. Oh, and mm -hmm. thank you so, so much Sage for sharing everything on, you know, and sharing your story, your sharing, giving us an inside scoop on your relationships, polyamory, yeah. human design and relationships. So much wisdom from you today. So thank much of that you. line six wisdom and definitely <laughs> lots of connection here. I, uh, I appreciate you so much. And I recognize the gifts that you have to offer. And I'm excited for people to reach out for you and get to experience that for themselves as well. So thank you so, so much Sage for being here. <laughs> Yes. Thank you so, so much. It was so great to connect with you. Um, and thank you for welcoming me into your space and into your community. It's so lovely to meet all of you. I hope to connect with you. And please, if, if you're not even interested in a reading or anything like that, and just want to connect, I would love that. That four, six in me is yearning for, for connection and networking. And so I'm always, always happy to connect. And I just want to th say thank you so much, Crystal. Like you are really the catalyst that really started my journey in human design. And it's been such a beautiful journey and so inspiring and so expansive. And I just never would have ended up here had I not stumbled across your videos. And so I just appreciate you for all of your gifts, um, for the Human Design Academy, the brilliant way that you are sharing about human design and teaching others about human design so that we can be, you know, really good stewards of energy in the collective space. Um, so I feel really grateful for you. So thank you. Thank you.